Hello everybody and thanks for watching this video. Today I'm doing a book report on The Fat of the Land by Wilhelmer Stephenson. This is uh, the second time I've done this book because the first video I did, uh, something happened to the audio. There's absolutely no audio whatsoever. Somehow that video got viewed over 600 times, which is a lot for me. Most of my videos, you know, I'll, uh, I get a handful that are over 100 and many of them that are 20 or less uh, with the exception of one one other video I did that's over 1,000 somehow. But uh, since uh, this, this is a fundamental book that's frequently referenced, I figured I better do it over. I'm doing it on a different setup, different software, different computer. Um, so it may look a little different. Uh, hopefully it comes out good. Um, I've had a lot of technical issues and this is literally probably the sixth or seventh time I've sat down and re-recorded the uh, audio over the slideshow. So anyways, uh, getting a little long on the tooth of this project, but uh, hopefully it pays off and hopefully uh, people enjoy it and the information gets out. You know, that's the important thing. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, this book is uh, kind of staple reading for people who are on the carnivore diet. It's kind of like the the proof that there's some historical uh, evidence for people just living on meat and water. So uh, that, that's probably clearly why uh, it's so popular because the carnivore movement is really taken off big time. Um, this is, there's, this is not a cookbook or anything. I know the picture there makes you think, well, you're going to learn how to eat, eat steak or cook steak or something. But, uh, this is a historical book. Uh, Velimir St Stephenson actually went to the Arctic and, and lived there and then wrote a, a number of books about it. This one being one of the most popular. Um, one of the things you find out that, you know, the Eskimos who lived with pretty much just ate meat and drank water. They didn't have tooth decay. Um, the book is available on Kindle, uh, soft cover. I think at Amazon's like 15 bucks. The there's PDFs floating around all over the internet that you can find if you're if you don't want to spend the money. Um, and uh, gosh, I think they must be original hardcovers. They're like when I the first time I did this video a month or so ago, they were they were like 200 and they've shot up to 250. So. You can see that the uh, rising popularity of the carnivore movement has sparked a lot of interest of people are going to spend an extra 25% on a book like that. So, My first thought when I read this book was, why didn't we read this in high school instead of Upton Sinclair's Jungle? Because you know, as an adult, I found out that the Upton Sinclair's book is, is fiction. You know, it's not real. Um, you know, and even, you know, it was written in pieces for a socialist publication. It was either a newspaper or a magazine or something like that. It was originally printed in that periodical uh, in, in chapters. And then eventually it was compiled in a book. And then, you know, you go to high school and they, and they have you read that book. And it's presented as literature. And it seems historic. And then you find out it's just fiction. And you figure, figure out it's kind of warped people's perception of food and how food was prepared and what was really going on. And, you know, I, I understand that uh, Upton Sinclair wanted to improve the working conditions of, for workers. And not that that's a bad thing, but I think uh, the unintended implications of the book um, really altered people's perception of, of what was going on in a way that's completely artificial. And a book like this is a factual account of somebody who actually experienced life in the Arctic and lived with um, Eskimos, many of which I believe uh, uh, Stephenson was the first, you know, actual white man or American that he'd ever met. So anyways, uh, I just thought a book like this actually had more value. And if if we had read this in high school, we might not have all fallen for that heart, heart healthy hypothesis. BS that uh, is pretty much the the center of contention in the low carb ketogenic carnivore primal uh, way of eating. 
The book originally came out in 1946, and it was called Not By Bread Alone. And then um, an updated version came out in 1960, and that's the one that's called Fat of, uh, Fat of the Land. So anyways, there's essentially two different versions of it. I think they're both available if you, if you want to read them. I, I read Fat of the Land. I didn't read uh, Not By Bread Alone. I believe everything that's in Not By Bread Alone is actually in out of the land so it's probably not necessary to read both but you might find them so uh i think in total he spent five years in the arctic um and i know he spent at least one year if not two years living with the eskimos and um when he came back from one of his trips to the arctic uh people didn't believe that he'd been living on meat the whole time they said that was impossible so our already you know around the turn of the century being the 1900 um era that people are already had a hard time believing that you could just eat meat you know you didn't need grains or vegetables or fruits or whatever to to be healthy so um he was challenged to be locked in a hospital ward and fed only meat and water and i think he was allowed coffee or something like that and uh, proved that, yeah, he's just as healthy as the day he came back. So then I believe also they did another uh, uh, study where, you know, he wasn't locked in the hospital. But and I, I think he had a one of his friends did it with him. So uh, they they were they only ate um, meat. And then I think they're allowed to drink water and sometimes alcohol or something like that. But uh, they spent another year being followed around and studied. Um, on a all meat diet as well so you know just like when you read uh, uh, studies and deficiencies you find out that people have already done these studies you know these studies are a hundred years old the evidence is already out there and why is it such a big mystery you know why is it so hard you know I, this book is referenced in so many new books you think, gosh, why is it so hard for, for, for people to believe that we've just been fed bad information for the last 50, 60 years or whatever? Uh, the, 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 this is the tagline right here from Amazon. This is the author uh, details his experiment in extreme nutrition and in a large edition of Not By Bread Alone, the book extols the virtues of meat in the human diet. So I don't know, they, you know, the, the, the tagline on Amazon considers an extreme, um, extreme uh, nutrition, but from a ancestral standpoint, it might be the original diet. So I don't know why that would be, you would really want to consider that extreme. Maybe eating fruits and vegetables and grains is the extreme. You know, so uh, he wrote, like I mentioned, he wrote several books. Uh, My Life of the Eskimos and, and The Hunters of the Great North are, are uh, two of his well-known books. But he wrote other books about the Arctic. And um, I think I have some pictures of him coming up in other slides in case people. But if you go, if you find, uh, type his name in on Amazon or some other book uh, vendor, you'll find uh, lots of titles for him. Right? There's probably eight or ten that are available so anyways I, I think some of them are even like a 99 cents on kindle or something they're probably long out of copyright so but it, his adventure pretty much included um eating meat and drinking water so anyways that uh ties it in quite nicely with the modern day uh um carnivore movement um i i often ask this question you know, are our teeth the canary in the coal mine? You think about how many kids have cavities when they're relatively young and they have to have dental work. And then also, you know, crooked teeth, um, not enough room for teeth, you know. So maybe this is all a, a sign of what's actually going on inside our bodies as well because a lot of this has been um, scientifically attributed to diets. So believe it or not, if your mouth is too small for your teeth, that's because you and your parents probably were eating a diet that was in, in insufficient in meat and, f and fat, particularly, you know, red meat and saturated fat. So maybe there is nothing new under the sun because this, this had all been worked out before, 
you know, before there was such a thing as a standard American diet, you know, they throw that out around or the Western diet, there was something known as a European diet. And they saw as grain cultivation moved into areas like I believe in Iceland, they could dig up uh, graves and um, pull out the uh, craniums of, of long deceased people, both before and after grain cultivation came to the area. And they could see the differences both in the teeth and the bones and the uh, for formation of the face. So, um, and, and then of course the other uh, skeletal effects because the more, the more uh, plant in the diet, the smaller the, the skeleton and the smaller the brain size, the, the less volume you have for brain. And when the, the face and the, the palate become smaller, the glands in the, in the front of the brain also have less room. And there are some studies that tie, you know, grain consumption to things like uh, mental handicaps and retardation and stuff like that. And they're starting to see more and more links to things like depression, anxiety, and even schizophrenia. So a lot of this uh, information was already somewhat established a hundred years ago. I don't, that's one of the reasons why I don't like, um, the labels like standard American diet or the sad diet is because a lot of times people make the assumption that that the problem is that there's preservatives or that the food is processed but you don't have to process wheat any more than the bare minimum to make it edible and you will still cause these health problems so and of course adding to that you know sugar I mean people have been been uh, crystallizing sugar from sugar cane juice for a very long time so i don't know that you really need to to uh, just label it standard american diet and let people assume that it's preservatives or processing or pollution or whatever that's the problem or video games or driving instead of walking or whatever all the things i've heard i don't i i don't think that that's necessary because the evidence existed long before the standard american diet was established The uh, book, uh, I think it's mostly the uh, added newer material um, that was added after um, uh, in the second version. Uh, they talk about all kinds of biblical and historical references to eating meat, particularly uh, fatty meats, you know, and why they were they were revered and important in society and religion and sacrifice and so on and so forth. So um, they, uh, they fluff out some more context, uh, that can be referenced as far as the importance of eating, um, animals. Um, they mentioned some other diets that are contemporary and a lot of people don't realize before this con heart healthy concept came along where you're not supposed to eat cholesterol or saturated fat or red meat, you know, the, supposedly these things clog your heart and give you cancer before that. There was a lot of people that, that contested this idea, but they were basically shouted down. And then once you get the government behind it, it guys like Ansel Keys comes along with his books and his hypothesis and tries to sell it as factual science which didn't work and that's why you find pictures of Ansel Keys with the cartoon devil horns on him because he might well have been responsible for killing more people than anyone else in history I mean they're still dying they're still being crippled and uh, we could probably uh, draw a pretty straight line between his dietary advice and the astronomical cost of health care these days and and the deterioration of uh, the quality of life of many people but uh, this this didn't happen in a vacuum. But what we for people who weren't around, then we don't know that it was so widely challenged. But you can look up these other diets and find out the controversy around it. Um, and that's another good reason to read these books. There's lots of historical clues, both from an anthropological and a, um, archaeological uh, standpoint. You know, we find the, the remnants of the settlements where people lived and you know, people, you know, they have this concept of there being hunter gatherers and there's this emphasis on gathering. And, you know, people came up with these theories that they ate. they gathered like 75 percent of their diet in the form of you know plants or tubers or whatever. And this is really not the case. If anything, it's more like like the the opposite of that. They probably ate at least 65 percent of their calories from animals and then they forged for 
for plants and stuff like that you know there the cave paintings you know they go back some 40,000 years are full of mammoth and um pigs and uh, antelope and deer and bear and all kinds of fish and stuff like that and that there's try and find uh, any drawings of any plants on there there really weren't any that were revered so anyways you know the, the more that they know and the more fossils they find they find out that these people had great teeth and then when they do isotopic analysis, they can tell not just that they were eating these animals, they can tell you what ratio they were eating these animals in. And they can also tell you how few plants they were eating. They were, because human beings don't live on grass, and a lot of these uh, large ruminants and herbivores, that's what they do eat. And so we know from looking at their teeth and then analyzing the isotopes in the teeth and the bones of these, uh, of our ancestors that they actually were eating the animals and not the, not the, not the plants, or in this case, mostly, um, grass. So, um, also you find out that, uh, you know, uh, things like, um, scurvy and stuff like that. People don't get scurvy if they eat fresh meat. And people don't get tooth decay and rickets and stuff like that if they eat fresh meat. So uh, Stephenson lived with the Mackenzie Eskimos who basically ate vegetables and berries in time of famine when there was, for some reason, they didn't, couldn't get fresh meat. These guys also just ate cooked meat, most of the, cooked and raw meat most of the time. They didn't really do much prep work or cooking. They Their, their concept of, you know, uh, a bunch of ingredients or seasonings or whatever... Uh, involved processes they called it French cooking and they considered that making your food taste like something else so it's kind of a reverse uh, what we you know we got a cable uh, TV full of uh, cooking shows and people are always selling you fancy pots and pans and new processes and you got to go to the latest restaurant and try out the new cronut or whatever the hell there that is popular or trending online at at that time but these guys just ate meat and drank water um, that you get introduced to the the concept of, of being able to get enough fat as well because um the term rabbit starvation is typically applied to this some animals are very lean and they don't have enough fat on them and so you cannot survive like you cannot survive eating rabbit i suspect that uh, you know a lot of your really athletic fast animals like deer and stuff like that they're very lean so most people don't want to try and live on them and you know they would eat dried or or almost rotten fish dried fish is often dunked in oil oil is often rendered from caribou they ate a lot of caribou meat and uh, the inuits didn't or the eskimos didn't use salt the the white people that came there brought salt and if you lived there long enough eventually you stopped using it it's an interesting thing because i kind of had it in my mind that we had to have salt somehow as you grow up people say oh you know don't eat too much sodium, you'll get high blood pressure, and then you find out one day if you've got a low-carb diet, you don't have to worry about it. And to some extent, you kind of need salt because otherwise you get dehydrated. But then uh, these Eskimos, they're just eating meat. They don't need any salt. Salt's, uh, adding salt to their food's a foreign concept. And somehow they're healthy, they're strong, they have a lot of endurance, they don't get cancer, they don't get cavities, they don't have diabetes. Hmm. I wonder what's going on there so uh yeah i think uh, we all kind of have this idea that you gotta have you know fresh fruits and vegetables or you're gonna get scurvy but you find out like i've mentioned if you eat fresh meat you'll cure scurvy or you'll just never get it and uh i don't know that it really talks about vitamin c so much in this book but um you find out too when you when you're on a all meat diet or carnivore diet you don't need as much vitamin c because your blood glucose uh is is lower and uh it doesn't it doesn't compete with uh, the vitamin c for in bodily processes so what happens is when you're on a high carbohydrate diet you need more vitamin c because your um your glucose levels are going to be higher so um i know i i was familiar with the term limey which in my mind was was associated with with the british and probably originally you know british sailors were stuck at sea without fresh meat for a long time used to have some sort of citrus 
to to offset their lack of fresh meat but it, the, nobody ever told me about the fresh meat part i just heard that you needed uh, vitamin c in order to prevent scurvy so there's kind of a short circuit there and here you can see uh there's a cover of hunters of the great north one of uh, stephenson's book and my life with the eskimo so they're available and i haven't read them yet but i definitely got them on my list of things to do because uh I think it's going to be fascinating to learn about that. I can't imagine hunting a polar bear with a bow. I, I'm a big archery fan. I love shooting a bow. Uh, of course, I don't. Where I live, there's not a lot of hunting going on. So, and there's definitely no polar bears outside the zoo. But holy cow, they don't get any bigger and meaner than a polar bear. I mean, polar bears have non-retractable claws, and they're just giant eating machines. And this guy takes it down with a bow a ra rather primitive longbow too um the uh the book points out uh something that comes up quite a bit in the carnivore and the uh, ketogenic and low carb movement is you know do you have to eat the whole animal well the eskimos t typically didn't um the ones that stephenson lived with they ate the muscle and the fat and they typically gave the organs to the dogs so those guys were nice and healthy and didn't seem to need to eat much organ meat or any organ meat at all now um i put this picture up here of a from a podcast called biohackers biohackers lab where they interviewed um dr sophie clemens who's a doctor from hungary now she works in a clinic where they treat a lot of people with autoimmune diseases and she says that to heal the autoimmune disease you definitely need to eat some organ meat, particularly liver and brain. So uh, maybe it depends on on uh, other factors, whether you need to eat organ meats or not, because there's certainly other cultures where the organ meats are actually valued above the muscle meat and the organ meats are considered more nutritious. And of course, if you grind up the meat in the laboratory, you're going to find more vitamins and things like the liver than you will in the regular muscle meat. So um but uh she she comes from the uh the um the idea that most of these people have autoimmune diseases because they have leaky gut or increased gut permeability and she actually talks about the tests they do to measure the gut permeability and um she's she feels in order to heal that you've got to eat more liver and brains so that might be some good advice i don't really know how we can explain why some cultures insist on eating organ meat over muscle and some just eat muscle and fat but for the for from a practical standpoint at least we have some idea why you might want to eat some uh, organ meats which are typically missing in most diets um the eskimo teeth tended to seem to regenerate um, these people chew on bones and don't get cavities and um, they don't seem to wear out their teeth chewing on bones which is just amazing and talks in the book about making jerky or dried meat and pemmican and how pemmican and pemmican is actually dried meat mixed with fat and it actually preserves for a long time i think it i think in this book it talked about a sample that was found that was at least 25 years old and it just been sitting around wrapped in um wrapped in rawhide or uh suede leather or something like that it also talked about the other um other animals you know ripe birds rotten fish high meats ripe cheeses and you know uh, there's more uh, information about salt and scurvy and all that those things that people are always concerned about when they hear about these extreme diets you know people who only eat meat and drink water and chew on bones can be long-lived and very healthy very stout very robust so here's a couple more pictures of Stephenson's book. One is called Prehistoric and Present Commerce Among the Arctic Coast of Eskimo. Uh, and then the other one is just another cover for uh, My Life with the Eskimo. So anyways, um, just books you can find out there for sure for sale. So I like to mention accessibility uh, since myself, I'm, I'm dyslexic and I prefer audio books as opposed to trying to read them. And um, does not appear that this book is available in audio form at all. But uh, I managed to use um, PDF read uh, Windows 10 machine um, with, you know, it's built into the Adobe reader and it will read uh, even a 
relatively poorly scanned version of the book which somebody gave me um, so that helps it is available on Kindle and if you're blind you can use the talk back on Kindle but if you're a sighted person who's used to using an Android device in the conventional way I do not suggest you try it because it's not just going to read you the book it's going to completely change how your phone or your whatever Android device you're using is operated so and it's very confusing and it might take you a while to figure out how to switch it back so if you uh, just want to keep on using your phone in the regular manner do not attempt this but on the other hand if you're blind it's a great option so um, I think it's important uh, to mention that uh, you know there's a lot of people with or without impairments that enjoy audiobooks a lot of people are able to leverage their time uh, you know behind the wheel or you know whatever kind of work they got to do with their hands and they can't sit there with a, in, with a book in front of them or a tablet in front of them so a lot of authors are kind of surprised when somebody talks to me doing an audiobook and they get another 30 40 percent of their sales from an audiobook so i always like to kind of float that idea if all possible to to have authors uh, and publishers make more audio books available there's a lot of good sources out there um, for information if information like this in this book um, uh, um, fat of the land interests you uh, i have a facebook group called the ketogenic fasting project and um, I like to follow the evidence where it leads, you know. I have a small group for just for autistic carnivores. And I have one called uh, Carnivory and Keto and the Meat Cult. And then uh, there's been, there's some classic sort of groups that some of them existed before Facebook. But they're, they have a big Facebook presence now, like zeroing in on health. The World Carnivore Tribe is pretty well known. Uh, I believe the World Carnivore Tribe was started by uh, Sean Baker, Dr. Sean Baker, who's an outspoken proponent of the uh, carnivore diet. And Zoriana Health, I believe, was um, uh, Charles Washington, who's he's a little more low key, but uh, he he's a good guy and he provides lots of great information and, and just wants to help people. He's an, I think he's a marathon runner. So. And then 100% Carnivore and Beyond, uh, that's a great group, uh, a lot more, uh, it's a fun group, you know, it's, um, I believe it's Phil Escott's group, he's a great guy, he's a lot of fun to talk to, he's got a lot of good information, and he, he really focuses on immune, uh, autoimmune disease healing, that's kind of his bailiwick right there, so that of course struck a chord with me, I've heard some good interviews with all these guys, um, different podcasts and stuff like that, and a lot of them have their own YouTube content they put out that you can check out for free. And I, I, uh, I, uh, so I encourage people. I mean, a lot of people are already on Facebook and I know a lot of people want to beat up on Facebook, but there's a lot of good resources in there for people. And of course there's all kinds of great podcasts, whether you use uh, iTunes or Patreon or whatever, there's all kinds of, uh, sources. And a lot of people have, have their podcasts on multiple, um, platforms. And of course, there's all kinds of different forms, electronic forms of books, audio books, hardcover books, softcover books. So there's lots of information out there, and I really want to encourage people to start exploring it. Uh, you know, I uh, don't want to confuse people uh, with the fact that I have a, a Facebook group and a YouTube channel that's basically titled uh, Ketogenic Fasting Project. Um, even though now I, I basically eat a strict carnivore diet, uh, one just kind of led to the other. And my, my true allegiance is to myself and my health. And I believe in uh, being my own best doctor, my own best guinea pig or lab rat, my own uh, best teacher. You know, I, uh, I think that uh, experimenting on myself, I don't, I don't, I'm not taking any crazy drugs or anything. I'm just experimenting with my diet and my exercise. And, uh, you know, dealing, I had, um, uh, arthritis really bad. And then I also had a psoriasis really bad. And the arthritis is gone. As far as I could tell, there is no vestige of arthritis left. Uh, psoriasis is probably about 80, 90% better. It hasn't quite gone away yet. And I'm still sort of dialing in on that. Um, and I also was diagnosed autistic, you know, and I had a number of other symptoms that, uh, that are kind of in that realm so but i'm convinced this is the most beneficial diet for me at least in, in this um, part of my life so i'm sticking with it 
I wrote a or did a video about um, the ketogenic fasting project going carnivore. So it's actually a fairly popular video. But if people have questions about it, I think a lot of people are going to go from some sort of low carb diet like ketogenic to the carnivore diet because they're they're going to be curious. They're going to want to try it when they try it. They're like, wow, this is great. It's better than what I was doing before. I mean, it's not going to be that way for everybody, but uh, I think it's a pretty natural progression for most people. I try and do uh, book reviews. I, I get the audio books or hardcover if I have to, and I, I go through them sometimes many times, and then I do a short video on them to hopefully encourage people to to um, to read the books themselves or listen to the books themselves. This was a, one I did recently. Anyway, you can... Um, by Dr. Annette Bosworth, a very powerful book um, written by a doctor, written by a doctor who's on a ketogenic diet, whose mother had very serious cancer, and uh, they were able to handle some pretty remarkable situations and get her mother's health back. So it's a lot of content in there for people who are baby boomers or whose parents are baby boomers that they're trying to help out. Um, it's not a book for the squeamish, that's for sure, but it's a great book. And Dr. Boz does a lot of videos on YouTube. She does a lot of interviews with her mom. She addresses a lot of ketogenic questions online. So definitely check her out. Uh, this is the one video I did here. It's on YouTube. You guys, anybody can watch it for free. Uh, you guys, if you subscribe, you help people out because in order to, in order to get um, any sort of compensation from um, putting videos on YouTube, you got to have a thousand subscribers and people watching over four thousand uh, hours of uh, a video a year before they even consider you. So um, this was my biggest video, which kind of surprised me. I was kind of hesitant to do it, but it actually has been very popular, and I got a lot of positive feedback from it because I talked about my my autism or my autistic symptoms and how these these diets positively impacted them so i invite people to check it out in all the videos the the best thing you can do is you know enjoy them and then send a link to somebody else who might benefit from it this is just a sample of some of the other videos i do as you can see i do a number of books including the older books like studies and deficiencies and letter on corpulence by William Banting, which comes up a lot. Newer books like The Big Fat Surprise by uh, Nina Teichels. And, you know, f uh, other well-known books like The Diabetes Code by Dr. Jason Fung. And some lesser-known books. And I also do books that are, that kind of espouse the opposing views, like the, the China Study and How Not to Die and stuff like that. So I don't, I'm not one who really wants to be stuck in an echo chamber uh, just, you know, uh, repeating stuff other people say and having people echo it back to me you know i like to go out there and explore the opposition i actually belong to some vegan groups just don't tell the vegans that right so um yeah if you could subscribe that would be great and of course watch the videos and pass them along you know check out some of these groups on uh on the on facebook or find other groups if you don't like facebook find uh, other groups you can uh, you can join online there's all kinds of forums but i encourage people i know this uh, going on an all meat diet and giving stuff up sounds really difficult and hard and all that but uh, start with a book like uh, fat of the land you know give it a read it's not that long of a book it's an easy read and uh enjoy it soak it up get exposed to the the concept and you know then maybe try it or something and see see if it helps you improve your health so anyways i want to thank everybody again for for um for watching the video or listening along and i sincerely hope this information can help somebody